Hey guys, today's review is the Legends novels Kenobi. Let's find out if this is an epic journey or if the story is as coarse as the Tatooine Sand. Stay tuned and find out next. Where should I start reading? What is canon versus legends? When does the story begin? The answer to these questions is right here on Star Wars Timeline. Are you Padawans ready? Because this is where the fun begins. I'm finally reviewing the book that I wanted to talk about for a very long time. This is the Legends novels by John Jackson Miller, Kenobi. It was published in August of 2013. The storyline here takes place 19 years before Battle of Yavin or before Episode 4. You guys guessed it right. This is the same very year that Luke and Leia Skywalker are born. Now, before we start discussing this book, I quickly wanted to mention the artist uh, Scott Beal. Guys, when this book was first announced and we got a revelation of the front cover, I was ecstatic about this book. I was so hyped. It's taking place on Tatooine. We got a promise of a space western with Kenobi, one of our favorite prequel characters, and of course, in the original saga. But we get to that period where it's right after Revenge of the Sith. So there was a lot of potential, a lot of talk about this book, and I personally was very excited. And partially, what really hyped me up was this awesome, awesome cover. When I looked at it, guys, I think it's still circling around to this day. The design of this book is just immaculate. I enjoyed it so much. Quick spoiler alert. Guys, I will be talking about the synopsis of the story here. I will discuss the characters. You will definitely know the ending of this book by the end of the review. So if you plan to read it on your own, I strongly urge you to read the book first and then come back and leave your comments in the video section below. Let me know what were your favorite parts of this book. Did you like the characters? Did the uh, writer treat the source material with respect? Do you disagree with my thoughts? I would love to hear all of it. Without further ado, let's start talking about it. First and foremost, we have to understand that the story here takes place immediately after Revenge of the Sith. This is the key point in this review. Remember this, guys. So, Kenobi arrives to Tatooine. As we saw at the end of the Revenge of the Sith, he passes infant Luke to Lars Owen and the Owens family, and he sets up his house. He starts interacting with the local farmers of the Danners Com uh, town, and he understands that they are under a threat from the Tusken Raider attacks. After one victorious battle, there's a young woman, Callie Calwell, who accidentally rides her dewback into a Sarlacc field. Before her mom has the chance to rescue her, Kenobi's right there. He helps rescue both of the women from the Sarlacc pit and is safely brought back to town. Kenobi begins to uh, frequent the Danner's calm town and he starts interacting with Annaline's family. All this time between the chapters, we have this forced Skyping event. Obi-Wan Kenobi is trying to reach out to his master's ghost. He tries to find communication with Qui-Gon Jinn because as you guys remember, in the uh, Revenge of the Sith, Yoda reveals to us that one of their friends, Qui-Gon Jinn, finds a way to communicate with them through the Force from the nether realms of the Force, right? This, once again, a very crucial, very important piece of this review. Remember this, guys. So we have these inter interludes going on throughout the novel. Uh, meanwhile, Kenobi sees what the settlers are doing to their tribesmen is morally wrong. He contacts the Tusken Raider tribe leader and he talks to this Ayark woman to try to understand the issue better. Annalie, in the meantime, develops the feelings for Obi-Wan Kenobi. The local farmer's leader, Orin Gold, he wants to marry her, but not because he's in love. It's in the beginning, there's sort of this love triangle between Obi-Wan Kenobi, this Annalyn woman, and this Orin God, but not really, because Orin has, he's motivated by greed. He's in depth with Jabba the Hutt, and he plans to plunder the town, as well as Annalyn's homestead, and try to get as much as possible to get rid of his debt. Kenobi stops Orin's scams, and immediately he becomes a target. He teams up with the Tuscans to take down Orin's militia. He plans to gather the Tuscan clans. Kenobi is pursued by Ori into canyons, and the group is attacked by the Crate Dragon, which was one of the highlights of the book. I would say it was probably the biggest piece of action we see in this novel. Kenobi destroys the beast, and doing so, he reveals his Force abilities. The moment that Orin sees that, he seizes the opportunity to basically sell Obi-Wan Kenobi to the Empire as his last bid for power, to make the money to pay off Jabba Hutt's goons, but also to assume control of the Danner's Com town. 
confronted in his uh, damaged lens, Peter, by Annalyn Kenobi and Ayark, uh, tribeswoman, he speeds off into the Tuscan Badlands. He's badly wounded, and he becomes a Tuscan slave. He's tasked with uh, doing the moisture farming, and because he's badly wounded, he constantly has to wear this mask, which is a very ironic situation, and was kind of an interesting a story beat for me. Everything that he fought against and was doing harm to all of these Tuscans, he inadvertently becomes one of them. Kenobi arranges for Annalyn and her family's safe passage off-planet so she could pursue her dreams of being, uh, travel the galaxy and study xenobiology. But he tells her that he's unable to join her because he has other responsibilities. Remember, I mentioned that Luke Skywalker, the infant, he's given to the uh, Lars uh, family and that Obi-Wan has obligations to him. Uh, so their brief relationship ends there. Annalyn is a little bit heartbroken because she had all these feelings for Kenobi, but they had to part ways. And this is how the novel ends. Now, let's talk about my personal impression of this novel. I'll give you guys my thoughts and why this novel doesn't work for me. And before I do that, I have to say that I'm a huge fan of John Jackson Miller. I don't have any issues with, his, with him as an author. I absolutely loved the work that he has done for the Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic comic book. So those are some of the best Star Wars stories I've ever read, so I never questioned his ability, talent as an author. I think my main gripe with this novel comes from the environment that it was written in, because George Lucas sometimes would ask authors not to touch certain areas, certain material, because he potentially would get to it. So I felt immediately that this novel was constrained by outside forces that the author didn't have any control of or at least this is the way that it feels to me i didn't i haven't done any extensive research of finding out exactly what how this book came to be all i know is remembering my early memories when this book was first announced how much hype and expectations we all had in the premise of a space western with obi-wan kenobi and what this book turned out to be so what are the biggest problems with this book. Before I address that, I want to mention a couple of good things that I really enjoyed about this book. I think that Miller's writing is very competent. He knows how to set up a story. He knows exactly what to do with the characters. So from the standpoint of technical execution, it's not a bad novel. It's actually written pretty well. It captures the atmosphere of Tatooine very well. All the landscapes, the Dune Sea, the Wastelands, the Tusken Raiders, you know, when you read the book, you're immediately put in the original Star Wars saga, and you remember once again what it felt like seeing Tatooine. Uh, he also is good at writing tension between the settlers and the Tusken Raiders. You definitely feel that there's a, a conflict going on there. And the way that he treated Annalene's emotions towards Obi-Wan Kenobi, I think were pretty well done, because that was probably one of the biggest emotional beats of the story and he really needed to handle that we sort of understand that obi-wan kenobi is a lot more reserved he's cool he's a jedi not he's not supposed to have any kind of relationships so you understand that if he's a colder kind of person in this book it is well justified because the kind of person obi-wan kenobi is but um annaline is exactly polar opposite of that she's the woman who has um she's a widow she has children but she's still very much a uh, young woman, he, you know, she, she has passion for Obi-Wan Kenobi. She sees the, his heroics and she's struck with him. You know, he, he's a handsome man and so forth. You get the idea. So those were the parts that I liked about the book. Now let's talk about the things I didn't like. And first and foremost, it's too many missed opportunities. First and foremost, Obi-Wan Kenobi's PTSD is nowhere found. He is a Jedi Knight whose entire order has been completely wiped out, almost entirely. Darth Vader is pursuing and killing off the last remnants of the Jedi Order. The Republic has fallen. Emperor Palpatine now rules the galaxy. Obi-Wan Kenobi has failed his student. He has destroyed uh, Anakin's body, and he uh, now understands that he's going to turn into Darth Vader. There's so much emotional baggage there, and almost none of it is addressed in the book. Instead... Obi-Wan Kenobi goes off this to this merry chase and he is involved with a local trouble on Tatooine, which has no relationship to the events of the rest of the galaxy, what's happening with the Jedi Order, what is happening with the Republic. It's a local problem. And Obi-Wan Kenobi spends his entire uh, 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 story trying to 
untangle that knot and try to figure out what, what to do and try to resolve that situation. I didn't understand where the author or the plot of this book is coming from. Also, there's no reciprocity from Qui-Gon Jinn. Remember I mentioned earlier in this review that there's some sort of force Skyping interludes where Obi-Wan Kenobi tries to reach out to Qui-Gon Jinn. He's completely abandoned. He's alone. But Yoda mentions at the end of the Revenge of the Sith that Qui-Gon Jinn is indeed now communicating with, to them through the Force. So why don't we see Qui-Gon Jinn's communication with Kenobi of trying to reassure him or teach him more lessons or try to give him hope and say, look, young Luke Skywalker is here by your side. Watch after this child. There is yet hope for us. The Jedi Order will be restored. None of it is in this book. It is so puzzling. It is so confusing. The book is called Kenobi. Qui-Gon Jinn is his master. He has failed his student, Anakin Skywalker. And you're not going to address it. Instead, you're going to involve yourself with the local trouble, with Tuscan, Tuscan Raiders. And that's all it's going to be. Once again, I just don't understand that decision making. So you guys can see the trend of what my main criticism of this book is. It's not the quality of writing. It has nothing to do with its author. He's a very, very capable Star Wars writer. It's what is in the book, the kind of content they try to pursue. Also, there is no interaction with uh, uh, Owen Lars Beru or trying to look at young Luke and try to uh, see where Luke's journey will be in the future. Yes, it's uh, arguably we can say that Luke is still an infant, so how much interaction Kenobi would have with him? That's understandable. But the whole conflict of uh, Lars Owen seeing what the Jedi uh, what happened to the Jedi Order and tried to protect young Luke from it. There is no friction there like we see in modern Star Wars comics. We also saw it in Star Wars Dark Horse Legends uh, comics where uh, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi tries to uh, check out, uh, check in on uh, young Luke Skywalker and Lars doesn't want him there. None of that dynamic is in this book either. Uh, and there's also no Asherod head. Now, this is my personal, very biased gripe, but there's one Jedi Knight who spends time with the Tusken Raiders and becomes one of the most crucial expanded universe characters in the future of Star Wars, much, much later during Star Wars Legacy comic books. For those of you guys who read him, uh, you would understand what I'm talking about. But if you don't and you're curious, just Google Asherod Head. Phenomenal, phenomenal character. And we see Obi-Wan Kenobi interact with this character in the comic books. And you have to remember, this is still Legends. This is the original Star Wars Expanded Universe. Within the same universe, Obi-Wan Kenobi interacts with that character in the comics. Well, so why he was missing from this book, I, I just felt maybe he's, he wasn't a requirement. Maybe it's just my personal want, what I wanted to get out of this book. But I felt it was such a huge missed opportunity to exploit such a powerful, beautiful character with awesome storyline. Once again, he's not in this book. And I was just scratching my head like, oh, man. Instead, we're dealing with just random uh, Tuscans. Speaking on the topic of Tuscan Raiders, we kind of get a little bit of their culture, what they're all about, what they're doing, and how basically the settlers are trespassing their territory and they're, they're quarreling with the tribesmen, whereas this is their native territory. I sort of understood it, but I have to mention something else here. That I just can't help but make a comparison. Kenneth Flint's The Heart of the Jedi. He also, a lot of the story deals on Tatooine here, and we also deal with uh, uh, Luke Skywalker interacting with Tusken Raiders. And boy, I have to tell you guys, the way that Kenneth Flint addresses this tribe here and the way he portrays them, their culture, and everything that you basically saw in one episode of the Book of Boba Fett, it is so expertly done here. It is so well fleshed out that I wish that the Kenobi book had anything similar to that. And again, it's something that I guess they wanted to set up a conflict where Obi-Wan Kenobi steps in and he is the highlight of the story. And uh, last but not least, there is no interaction with Bail Organa. There is no overture that Obi-Wan Kenobi makes to the future res uh, rebellion. There is no establishing of the cells. There is no planning ahead or at least contacting Bail Organa and saying, hey, what are the next steps? Are, have we completely given up the fight? Where, what are we going to do next? We have, uh, you have Leia, I have young Luke over here. I'm going to look after him. But in the meantime, we have to seed, plant the seeds of the future rebellion. Once again, 
none of it is addressed. My point is that everything that transpires in this book has nothing to do with the greater events of the Star Wars or even with Obi-Wan Kenobi. When I discuss this book with fans on my uh, Facebook group, on other Star Wars forums, I bring this point forward. If you take the main character and replace Kenobi with any other Jedi or even a non-Jedi, it could be any newly invented Star Wars character, and the novel would pretty much be intact. It would still work. One argument that you could make, well, no, hold on a second. During that fight with a crate dragon where Obi-Wan Kenobi demonstrates his Force abilities, which becomes a, a piece of the puzzle in this plot, then you could say, like, yeah, no, perhaps you still need a Jedi. But it could be any Jedi. Because the Kenobi that we see here is almost unrecognizable. Not only do I not see Ewan McGregor's uh, portraying the role here, but I don't see how this is Obi-Wan Kenobi from the films in general. Because none of the stuff that he should be dealing with is in this book. And this is my biggest gripe with the story. So before I give this book my final score, so I'll answer the question, so who is this book for? Would I recommend it at all? Guys, I will always recommend any Star Wars book, whether I like or dislike it. Why? Because I strongly believe that we all have very different opinions. We have different sets of expectations. And we just are moved by different things in storytelling. So just because I didn't like Kenobi, it's no indication this is a bad book by any means. I know tons of fans who like it. There's a pretty strong argument that if you read it, you will like it, and you'll come back to me and say, well, Ben, I disagree with you on point A, B, and C, and let's have a conversation about this. And I'm more than open to do that. That's all. That's what it's all about. Maybe I will eventually come back to this book, reread it one day, and have a completely different angle. My opinions and things are never rigid. They're never set in stone. If I feel about something this particular way, in the future, my opinion may or may not change. So I would definitely recommend this book for anyone who loved the episodes from the book of Boba Fett where he is interacting with the Tusken Raiders. If you enjoy Tatooine, if you enjoy Tusken Raiders, this book is definitely for you. Also, if you want a Star Wars story that is isolated, that you don't need any prior reading, any requirements to start reading Star Wars books, whether it's canon or legends, this is a pretty good starter novel. As a matter of fact, in one of my book recommendations for beginners, I bring this novel up and I say, hey, this is one of the books that you could begin with and see if you like to check out other Star Wars literature. Um, so yeah, this is the kind of audience that I recommend the Kenobi book for. So what is my final score? I would give this book two out of four rating. Again, nothing against John Jackson Miller. I think he's a wonderful author. He knows how to craft a story. I just feel that Obi-Wan Kenobi as character was misused in the story. And I would surmise that uh, a lot of it was out of the writer's hands because George Lucas or, or story group of the expanded universe, there was particular plans that it wanted to continue in a different direction. Maybe there was other uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi show in development. We don't know that. Or maybe there was a, a future Star Wars Obi-Wan Kenobi storyline that would be developed in the um, seasons of the Clone Wars show that we didn't foresee. Stuff like that. You never know with things like this. But the point is, what is in this book doesn't work for me. It doesn't address anything that Obi-Wan Kenobi should have been dealing at this point in his life. After Revenge of the Sith, after Order 66, after the trauma of losing Anakin Skywalker and failing him, and basically having no hope, and even Qui-Gon Jinn, which there's absolutely no excuse, doesn't communicate with his former Padawan. I just don't understand it. This is where I'm coming from. My rating is 2 out of 4. If you guys disagree... Please let me know in the comments section what you think of this novel, if you enjoyed it more than I, and let me know if you, like myself, were looking forward to Asherod Head, and there's, I believe, only a very brief mention of him, but we never see this character, and boy, I really wanted him in this story. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for checking out this review. If you want to check out my previous reviews or look forward to the next ones, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and I'll check you guys next time. Take care.